give it a level. Give it a level. Hello, hello. You good? Good. What's up, guys? How are we doing? Good, you? Hello. How you going? Good. All right. Is uh, my wife? My wife's working. Okay, good. All right. You let me know, BJ. Okay. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, appreciate you being here and all the coverage uh, this year. Um, obviously, we made uh, an announcement yesterday regarding uh, JB's future here with us. Um, we would like to thank JB uh, for all his contributions uh, to this franchise, this organization. Uh, I think it's undeniable uh, the amount of success he's had with us, um, pushing us from a rebuild to where we are now. Um, what makes this even more difficult is he was an incredible partner and uh, personally a friend of mine and um, we, love, we love him as a human being, and so that makes it even more difficult. I want to send a special thank you to Nikki Bickerstaff, his wife, um, and, and, and their kids and their family. They've dove into this community like none other. Um, they're a fabric of the community. Uh, they gave tremendous contributions um, to Cleveland, and so uh, we just want to thank them for their time here. Uh, wish them, obviously, nothing but the best. Um, and. Uh, you know, we'll move forward, but uh, they'll always be a, a big part of our story. And so just wanted to thank JB to start, um, and uh, we can open it up for questions now. Kobe, you mentioned last year to end the speculation mm -hmm. at this time of, of JB getting fired on the heels of mm -hmm. the next series. So what changed over the last year that made you feel like you had to make this? So I'll, I'll say, you know, again, tremendously difficult uh, decision. Um, not going to go into sort of any shortcomings or negatives about JB. It's not something that he did specifically. Um, I think for us, it's with this group, um, finding someone with a new approach, um, someone with a different voice, a fresh set of eyes to help us move forward. And we've accomplished a lot in the last few years, getting to a conference semifinals, and we don't want to be complacent. We don't want to be content with that. And so what are the levers that we can push and pull to get to that next level? Because we feel we're not far off. We feel we have a tremendous amount of talent in-house. We have players that believe in each other, believe in this organization, and think they're pretty close. And so it's, it's not one singular thing that, that JB did wrong. It's how do we continue to move this thing forward? Uh, because we don't think we're far off. At this point, have you gotten assurances from Donovan Mitchell that he's going to sign long term with you guys? How long are we going to make, <laughs> make that question? <laughs> Um, one, we can't talk to Donovan now about the contract um, until July. I'll say that my exit interview with him was, was, was really good in that he was talking about the future and how excited he was about the team, the organization. Um, you know, this is a player that has had two of the best years of his career here, um, has had a lot of success here, um, understands the infrastructure, I think, um, has a lot of trust on what we're doing and understands that our goal is to win a championship. And again, um, when we're talking to him about the future here, getting his feedback, it's all about how do we make this thing better? How do we achieve this together? How do we win in the future? And so those, I take those as very positive things. Um, from his own words, he says he's happy here. Um, he likes it here. And so he's always been very genuine. He's always been very intentional. He's been a great teammate. And we have to take all that and face value and say, okay, um, we feel good about where we are with Donovan. Obviously things could change. Um, in terms of his contract future, it's nothing we can talk about until, until July. How much influence does he have? Yeah, how many questions? I'm sorry, go ahead. <laughs> um, how much influence does he have? So last summer, um, he had a lot of influence in, in terms of how, how much he helped us recruit uh, free agents to be here. Um, listen, he's, he's, you've talked to him. He's a highly intellectual um, basketball junkie, right? And so I would love to have some of his input in terms of, you know, what we want to do into the future. Um, and, yeah, absolutely would love his feedback and how we, you know, how we continue to build this thing. Um, I think he's been very influential in helping us land some free agents. Um, that conversation will come for sure. How do you think that uh, 
Donovan and Darius work together as well as you thought they would, or is, do you see a, an issue there? I don't. I think that's, that's overblown. I'll say this. I think there's way more data that speaks to it works than doesn't. You know, in the last two years uh, combined, because they've been together for two years, there's a lot of data that we can look at, right? And so over the last two years, including the playoffs, they're a net positive plus five together on the floor. Um, everyone wants to throw out the first year together when Darius actually had one of the best years of his career. He was an all-star, but he actually had more efficiency, and that was with Donovan. Um, they have a great relationship on and off the court. Um, I think the other thing that we have to, to realize is that, you know, this is just year two of this iteration of this team. And, you know, taking the zooming out a little bit, when you look at some of the most successful teams over the past decade that had real success in the playoffs, they've had a long run at this thing. You know, going back to Golden State, that's been together for 12 years, that core. You know, look at Milwaukee. That's been together almost 11 years when you look at Giannis and Chris Middleton and their run together, right? That's 11 years. Uh, Boston, I want to say seven years together, right? And they're still knocking at the door, right, for that championship. But that's been a core that's been together for seven years, had a lot of success together. Obviously, Denver, when you look at Jokic and Jamal Murray for eight years, we're just in year two of this, this iteration. And we got to a conference semis. We're not, con no, we're not content with that. Um, but there's a lot of runway left and there's a lot of learning left to be with this core. Um, and I, listen, I think this pairing has a, has a chance to be really successful together and the data speaks to that over the last two years. Do you anticipate not breaking that, that pair up? I don't see why we should, you know, I don't, I don't see why we should. I think, um, and the same thing goes to the, you know, the, the, they say the fit of the Evan Mobley, Jared Allen, that, that fit actually has a higher net rating. Than, than our guards. Um, I think the other thing too, like, again, you know, looking at, at it, there's a depth of talent here that, that's really, really good. And when you look at the, the, the landscape of the league and how long, like 82 games, we can't discount injuries, right? And it's part of our game. Um, it's a horrible part of the playoffs this year. Um, but I feel like, listen, when, when Darius and Evan went down, it was really nice to have Donovan and Jarrett keep us at a really competitive level, right? Same thing when Jarrett goes down in this playoffs uh, with a broken rib, it's really nice to flex Evan into that five spot, right? We, we, we don't compete without Evan being in that five spot. And so I know people wanna talk about the, the fit. I push back on that in terms of just the, the, the net ratings, but I also wanna talk about the depth of talent here that's really good, that keeps us alive when we have to go through some, some injury spells. Kobe, what were your expectations for this season? And then how did this match with what you expected? I wanted, to, um, I wanted to be highly competitive in the playoffs. You know, we had a taste of playoffs last year, um, fell short um, with, a, with a young roster and, and, and inexperience. Um, this year, I wanted to be highly competitive in the playoffs. I think we were. Um, obviously, we weren't whole. I'm not going to make excuses. I think a lot of teams are going through what we went through. So we can't just say this is a Cavaliers thing in terms of the injuries. Um, look, it's hard to say this season wasn't a success when you look at you know, our first conference semifinals since 2018. And so um, you know, we were disappointed with how it ended. Uh, but certainly um, through a lot of adversity this year, um, got to a point where we're, we can look back and say, okay, I think we're going in the right direction. Um, we're having success in the playoffs and we're setting ourselves up in the future for some real, for, for a real run. And that's the key, you know, that's the key is really diving deep into um, what are the levers we can pull, where we can clean up some things, how do we maximize some talent in house to give ourselves a chance to make a run like some of the teams I talked about, right? That are seven, eight, nine years into this thing and really knocking at the door of championships, if not won a championship. We're just year two of this thing. Do you, um, how high do you rate that you need to get an experienced head coach? I mean, for example, like when Beeline, you had to make a change, John Floyd or whatever, you had JB there and mm -hmm. you had you know, two trial runs to being a head coach and, and there was immediate 
difference with that. So I just wondered how do you, is with this thing, like you said, there's high expectations for your team. So in terms of that profile to have head coach. Terry, it's, it's, a, it's an excellent question. I, I'd be lying to you if I said I've already dove into a list of, of, of people um, and criteria. Um, we're going to take the weekend, decompress, um, come back Tuesday and really sit down with the staff and go over those questions. Um, it, it's a massive undertaking. First of all, when you had a, a, a person, a man, um, as good as JB, uh, to get to the conclusion of, okay, we need to go in a different direction. So that, that has taken up all my mind capacity along with combine and LA draft workouts. Um, we're gonna take the weekend and come back and really map out what that is. I think the difference between, and we haven't had a search for five years. Um, we, we've had real continuity here, front office, bench. Um, and so we haven't had a, a search in five years. That search five years ago is completely different than this one. This is a very highly specific job requirement in terms of the questions we're gonna ask. Um, very, very specific to the talent level very specific to how we can get even, achieve even more than we have. Um, and obviously some characteristics that we talk about from a cultural standpoint, but there will be very highly specific questions that I think I'll have. Um, but I can answer you more next week in terms of criteria, experience, and, and, and starting to compile a list. Kobe, this time last year, you were very adamant, no real need to look at major roster alterations and you were true to your work. So as you stand here right now, do you, understanding what you said about the external perception about fit versus mm -hmm. your internal evaluation of fit, um, do you have that same thought process right now that you don't need to make any major decisions or, or I should say alterations? And is that something you would be open to this off season if opportunity presented itself? Yeah, I don't, I don't see a, a, a big, uh, major sweeping changes. I just don't. Um, like I said, more data speaks to this works than it doesn't. Um, you can't win 99 games over the regular season, make it to a conference semis and be like, this doesn't work. Um, again, this just being year two of this iteration of this core being together. Um, I have a lot of, of um, excitement for the future for this group um, and belief in this group. The other piece that um, you know, the outside doesn't see is you meet with every player and they have a really strong belief in the, the core of the group, uh, their fellow teammates. They think they can win here. Um, there's a lot of camaraderie and belief and, and they like each other. And so it's hard for me to, to glean anything other than how do we pour more into the group that we have. Sure, there's, there's some moves you can make um, you know, uh, around the peripheral, but you know, what are the levers we can pull? What can we tighten up? Um, where is our upside? Where's the low hanging fruit in house um, to elevate this thing? And like I said, way more data speaks to how, how much more success we've had with this group than it does, uh, I, I think, the outside perception of, of, of fit. Um, we've won too many games. We've had playoff success. Um, and, and we're still young, you know? I mean, we haven't even talked about Evan Mobley and, and his ascension. Like, He's continuing to get better. He's only known postseason basketball since he's been drafted. And to see his, you know, see him elevate game five of Boston on the road and be the best player on the floor that night um, leads me to believe we have so much more to grow with him. And so there's a lot more in house than, than I need to find out outside of this building. There's a lot of belief in our players and each other. Uh, in this organization, and so I, I don't see the need to make sweeping changes. There was a lot of conversation about floor spacing this year, and mm -hmm. that run, that 18 and two run, mm -hmm. like that really showed. Yep. So how do you create? How do you create that floor spacing with the two bigs? Because you're right about Evan, but he did that when Jarrett wasn't available. Mm -hmm. You know, Darius seems to play better when Donovan is not on the floor. So I guess, you know, where's the balance there and how do you, you know, create that while maintaining the continuity of the, this core four? Sure. I think one, you know, the net ratings of both of them on the floor together is positive, right? From Jared and Evan and from Darius and Don, both positive to the, to the, almost to the tune of plus five, right? When they're both on the floor together. Um, 
I think it speaks to the depth of what we can do from an offensive standpoint. Um, why can't we do both? You know what I mean? Um, could it get a little clunky with two bigs on the floor? Uh, but guess what? On the other side, we're really good defensively. That's been true since we've had these two together. It's been an incredible defensive uh, group, and, and th that helps us win games in the fourth quarter as well. And so do we, look, do we need to look at diversifying the offense? Sure. Um, that's something that we need to do. Um, Evan continues to space the floor, and we want him to shoot more threes. Uh, he was in the 30s this year, and that's something that we're going to continue to elevate in his game. Um, and again, continue to get better. You know what I mean? It's, th this is not the end of the story for this group. It'd be one thing if we just maximized everything, put everything into this group, and just kept falling short. Again, this is just year two. Evan's just 22 years old. Jared's the oldest 26-year-old I've ever been around. Um, and so I just think we have a runway here to figure it out and give him a chance at it. How do you bounce the, Oops, sorry, go ahead. You mentioned the, the young guys like Evan Mobley and yeah. the development. How much does that specific part of this, the development of him and, and Darius Garland, weigh into off-season decisions with head coaching and even some of the roster decisions you guys will make? So the Evan piece is a really fascinating study because the, the balance of – of developing a top three pick and the talent that he has with us trying to win big is really difficult. That's difficult for a head coach. That's difficult for an organization. Um, because if, if we weren't trying to win big, I'm sure we could have rolled the ball out and had Evan scoring 20 points a game. But that means Evan Moby's probably not in the conference semifinals either, competing at the highest level. And so when you look at a top three pick like Evan, um, it's very rare that they play postseason basketball since the day they were drafted. You know, he, he played in two playing tournament games his first year, played in the first round last year, into the semis this year, conference semis this year. Um, we feel that's a huge part of his development, just playing winning full, meaningful games is part of it. Um, did we get away from unlocking his potential fully? A little bit this year. And I think that needs to be a vocal point into the summer of how we can unlock him, only because it's going to make our team even better and give us a chance to, to elevate um, to a higher level. It's gonna unlock not just him, but this organization. So that's certainly a vocal point. Um, in terms of Darius, Darius knows he needs to have a, a major off season. Him seizing, seeing the physicality uh, of that series, of both series really, um, is something that I think he's gonna, he's gonna grow from. Um, he had a tough year in terms of the injury piece um, losing all that weight from the jaw injury, uh, never regaining that, um, trying to re-ingratiate himself to a team that was rolling as well, um, was hard for him. And I think he knows this needs to be a big off season for him. Uh, but I love the experience we're giving our young guys. I, I just can't, I don't know how you, it's invaluable when you're playing in high level playoff series, playing against the number one team uh, in the NBA from a record standpoint, the Boston Celtics, um, going up against that experience, um, Evan by far is the youngest guy on the floor. Um, next was Darius. And so that's, that's a core we're really excited about into the future and giving them that experience in the playoffs was huge this year. You mentioned the Bostons, the Denver's, Milwaukee's, Golden States. It seems like increasingly those teams are the outliers. Like a lot of the league changes around every summer. So how do you balance your long runway idea with maintaining urgency? Because you know you guys, you never know how uh, long the runway is going to be. Yeah, I think when you speak to the urgency, I mean, it went into the decision to, to dismiss JB, you know, um, it's, it's part of it. It's not being complacent. It's not saying, you know what, we know we're going to get back here next year. So let's just roll it out again. You know, we know that we have a 22 year old Evan who's going to continue to get better. So we got time at this thing. Um, that's not the task at hand. The task is looking at every part of our organization and having that urgency, right? Not being complacent, right? Going into this off season, um, look, it, it, it's, no, it's a major decision to let go of your head coach. It is, after a half decade with him. It's a major, massive undertaking to do a coaching search. Um, and, and we're going to embark on that and find the right leader to help push us forward. And, and yes, I think there's a long runway in terms of the talent, the guys that are under contract. Um, that's exciting. But from a man in my, in my uh, office on the way out, Every player said we can do, we're, we're right there. You know, we, we want to win this thing, right? We, we think we're very close, which is exciting for me. And now I have to find different levers to figure out how we can re realize that, that potential. To that point about time to evaluate everything, mm -hmm. how do you feel you 
guys have done pulling the levers and how you feel about your, your place in the organization right now? Whose place? Yours. Oh, my, I, I, I mean, listen, I think that's for you guys to decide, you know, what we've done. I think, um, you know, in a, in a relatively short amount of time, uh, we've rebuilt this thing to where it is now. Um, I, not so long ago, we were at 22 wins, you know, and if we stayed like that, I wouldn't be here, right? So I think we've had um, a tremendous amount of success, but I would leave that to you guys to decide the job we do. Hey, Kobe, how, yeah. um, did you expect more from uh, Spruce and Yang, especially Yang? Yeah, I think George would tell you, and he told me in his office, he knows he can be better um, in the playoffs. He knows he could have been better in the playoffs just in terms of shot making. Um, what he gave us over the regular season was 82 games. He's one of the, one of the, one of the only guys that played all 82 games. Uh, he brought a toughness, a competitiveness. Um, he was serious, but also so lighthearted that he kept it. You know, we went through a lot of adversity this year. Um, the projected starting five only played 28 games together. Uh, when they did, we were 18 and 10, so it was pretty good. Um, I think he will tell you that um, from a shot-making standpoint, um, he could have been a lot better in the playoffs. Uh, he did bring a lot to us during the regular season, um, which is part of it. Um, and I think he, he knows from his standpoint what this offseason means, but he still has a lot of belief in this, in this program. Um, Max had the best year of his career, statistically. Um, you ask him, he thinks he can do better. He thinks he can shoot better. There's things he wants to do better from a, a, a playing standpoint. Um, we didn't know, I mean, I didn't know about the, you know, the, the playmaking. You know, we, we, you know, we thought we were getting a basketball player. We didn't know that he was gonna um, have the best year of his career from a statistic standpoint. Passing, rebounding, um, d defense. Uh, it brought a lot of intensity, a lot of seriousness. Um, and he was the first one to say we're not content with just making the second round. This is a guy before us that went to two finals and a conference finals in between. So he has a lot of um, internal data of what that looks like and how you get back there. And so we love his leadership. We love his feedback. Um, we're very, very happy with him um, and his play and his leadership and uh, his fearlessness. I mean, there's the, the toughness, the grit. I mean, we put him against some of the best wings in the, uh, in the world and he competed and gave us a chance on that end. Um, he's a much better basketball player than I, I thought when we, when we uh, acquired him. Yeah. Um, I don't, so again, absolutely, like have to find the right leader. Um, there's pressure in everything we do. So I get the importance of this, um, you know, there was nothing that JB did categorically wrong. You know what I mean? That, to say that now we have to get this right. You know, I think there was a lot of things we did incredibly well over the last four and a half years that he was at the helm. I think, you know, going back to the original statement is, you know, what's a fresh set of eyes look like? Uh, what's a new approach look like with this particular group? And um, how can this uh, new candidate really, or new head coach really push us to the next level? Uh, Dan will for, for sure play a role, um, you know, at the end when I sort of present him with our, our finalist. Um, Dan gives incredible insight. Um, you know, I love when he's involved because uh, it's it just helpful. It gives you support, uh, but it also he's, he thinks outside the box. He pushes you. Um, and so I'd say at the end, he, he certainly would have a, a big influence on what we do. Um, you know, obviously our front office will run the search. Um, there's a lot of hours, days, weeks that go pour, that pour into this decision. Uh, there's, there's hours spent with the candidates. Um, there's phone calls, there's, there, there's, there's background. Um, and so from a, uh, just, just a mechanic standpoint, we're gonna take the weekend uh, off right now just to decompress a little bit. Um, I know people already have lists that we have, but it's not true. Like we're gonna come back on Tuesday. Uh, we're gonna go over sort of characteristics what are the specific questions that we have, and then start to compile a list, and then go from there. Kobe, why did, um, just curious, why did it take you, you know, a week and a half or whatever it was to, to just 
So, Terry, good question. Um, one, it's not, there's, there wasn't a knee jerk reaction. You know, it wasn't like, ah, oh, this is not gonna, this is not gonna work. There's been too much success for us to have that conclusion after one day. Um, it was gonna take several days to really uh, dive deep into the evaluation of JB, who, who deserved that. Um, it certainly took, um, there, was, there was time spent with him as well during this process that he deserved and, and I thought was really healthy in terms of our dialogue. Um, and then also not to make excuses, but you know, when you, when you play a little deeper into the playoffs, it puts you right up against the draft. And so we were dealing with draft combine while playing Boston. So going back and forth, um, you know, last week we're out in LA um, for, for agent workouts. And, and so not that that slowed it down, uh, but it certainly added to what we had to do. And there's a, obviously we have the 20th pick in the draft. Uh, draft is immensely important to what we do. And so those two things together sort of put us to where we are now. But I wouldn't have said it, it wouldn't have been appreciably earlier anyway. These are just the things that we've, we've had to deal with over the last week. Is there week. anything he could have said or promised to kind of get one more crack at it? It's a good question, Terry. I, would th I would think about that. I think for us, um, again, with this, I keep going back, with this particular group, I think a new approach was needed. input that you received during the exit interviews, did that provide anything as far as making the decision for the coaching change from what you heard from the players directly? So we, we always take input from the players. Um, I think it's, it's definitely a valuable exercise. Um, at the end of the day, you know, the decision has to be, come from me um, and no particular player or players. I have to do what's right and find the right match for this set of a player, this group that we hope will have a long runway and a lot of playoff success um, and, and identifying who that is. And so we got a lot of positive feedback from players. Uh, you get negative impact from players, but my job is to listen, uh, decipher through all of that and, and come to a conclusion. Um, there's, there's feedback that helps us as a front office. It has nothing to do with coaches. There's feedback from an organizational standpoint of how we can get better. Those are the questions I'm asking too. Um, how do we make this the best place for you to be successful? Um, that's a driving force behind what we do. And so there's a lot of things we talk about, not just the, the coaching staff, but how we can improve. And, and, and we take that, that feedback um, seriously. But at the end of the day, you know, from a coaching standpoint, like that's, that's my decision. And as far as all the injuries that the teams had, you said that the starting five only played 28 games together. Yeah. Is it something that you maybe, was it just coincidence or is it something that you think maybe far as training wise that something needs to be changed or updated? It's, there's a few things that, that is the hardest things that we have to do. Um, figuring out this injury thing um, is not just particular to the Cavs. Um, we had a hard year this year from injury standpoint. Last year we were actually pretty good from a games missed standpoint. Um, you know, just again, zooming out and looking at the league as a whole, I've never seen a playoffs like this where we've seen this many stars out, right? That was not specific to just the Cavs. And so I think just looking at like the landscape of the long season and what it entails now, because I think it's a really good question. Like how do we solve this player injury piece? And I think, you know, we have more meaningful games now during the regular season than we've ever had. And so we, we've added the, the in-season tournament, right? Now the NBA Cup that has, I think, five games of, of group play. That intensity gets risen, right? That, that, those are playoff level intensity games that are in the beginning of the season. Um, the play-in tournament at the end of the season, which we thought was gonna elevate sort of the teams at the bottom to try to make it at the end and make a run at it. The unintended consequences, the top six teams don't want to lose and drop out of it. And so for the last few weeks of the season, you see a huge ramp up in load and in playing in meaningful games. And then the league adding the player participation program, you know, 65 games or less, um, puts another burden on, on, this, on this usage. And so now you're going into the playoffs and over the course of 82 games, how much have we expended on these players' bodies? Some we need to figure out, you know, some we need to study. 
Um, we need to figure out how to manage five and seven game, five you know, five games in seven days, three games in four days, big, you know, it's a lot of games in one month. Um, these are big questions for us, and it's something that we're trying to figure out to be better at. But you can clearly see this is not just a Cavs issue. Um, we need to figure out how to navigate 82 games and then playoffs, and then us specifically post All-Star into playoffs, how are we playing our best basketball and how are we healthy? Because if you look at it, and they're a great teams still playing, but they're the most healthy teams that are still playing. And, and that's something that, that we're studying. How much of that was over the course of an 82 game season, kind of managing a rotation, going, going a little deeper during the regular season? And do you think that it all had any effect? You know, second half drop offs the last couple of years, do you think that also plays into it? I think the one Spencer, the one silver lining of the injuries was we actually figured out we had some depth. Um, you know, you saw the emergence of a Sam Merrill, uh, which is incredible. Um, hugely important for us moving forward. Um, you saw uh, undrafted, undrafted rookie Craig Porter Jr. figuring out that he has a real chance at this thing and to be successful and be a rotational player. Um, you know, obviously you don't want to have injuries. But see, these are some of the silver linings that we figured out that we have real depth of this roster. And then to your point, how are we using that depth over the 82 games? And really diving into, you know, how are we breaking up the game, the, 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 the season into segments, knowing we want to be playing our best after All-Star and being healthy into the playoffs. Um, those, are, those are crucial questions. Uh, I think we have the roster to, to navigate that a little bit better. Sorry, what I was going to ask earlier, did Donovan's contract status or Donovan's views at all impact the decision to fire JV? No. What is your timeline for wanting to have a new coach in place? <sighs> That's a good question. Um, you know, I think we'd love to have a coach in place for the draft. I think that might be even too, that'd be probably too aggressive a timeline. Um, it's when we come up with the right decision for. Um, who's the right match for this group. And if it has to drag on a little longer, it does. Um, it's, it's, these are, this is such an important decision for us. Like I said, we haven't had a search in a half decade, so um, we need to get back together as a group and really um, talk about criteria, the specific questions, who we want from a cultural standpoint, create a list, and then really dive deep into those candidates, um, get to a finalist. And, uh, but I, I, I won't say it's, it's something that we need to, to rush. Yeah. Before you, is there any concern that they're ahead of the game when it comes to that and you could miss out on somebody that you want? Potentially, uh, but that doesn't mean we need to speed up our process. Kobe, what do you think? Earlier, um, Jared had a broken rib. Obviously, so this is a confusion. Um, what is your view of just his injury situation and how much it affected you guys? That's, it was massive. Um, it was massive. Um, the most important player we had all year in terms of games played and, and his value. Um, he played 81 straight games um, and, you know, it, having a pierced rib, you know, I, I've never had a broken rib, but I've had a, several people reach out to me um, about how much it hurts. You can't drive to work, you can't sleep, you can't tie your sneakers. Um, to give you some insight to what Jared did, I mean, Jared tried to give it a go. I mean, to the last day and a half, he was trying to go up and down on this floor and do some real basketball moves. Um, it's hard to play basketball if you can't raise your arms over your head. Um, you know, I know there was, there was speculation of more stuff he could have done. Um, it's impossible uh, to, to, to play through what he was playing through. Um, so going, going through. Kobe, it was a pierced rib. It was a pierced rib. Kobe, the, um, <laughs> what, you know, last year going into the offseason, it was clear the bench needed to be addressed. You did. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the injuries opened your eyes to the depth that you have. What do you think you're missing to get to that next level? Because you're, you know, you're on the doorstep. You mean from a roster standpoint? Yeah. Um, again, I have great belief in the talent here. You know what I mean? If, if I didn't, I would say we're going to look at all these different things and maybe breaking up the core and trying to bring um, other guys in here. Um, I think around the margins, how do we get better? Um, how do we maximize the talent we have in-house? Um, and, and, and really try to pull levers that we have here um, you know, from, from, from every angle that we can look at uh, to maximize what we have in-house. And so um, we'll look 
you know, we've been super aggressive in the past. Uh, we've made, you know, this front office, we've made some sweeping changes. We've made some sweeping moves before, you know. Um, to the Jared Allen question, like, Jared has a lot of equity here. I mean, we, we traded for Jared and the whole trajectory of the rebuild changes, right? Um, you go out and, and trade for a Larry Marketing, uh, who helps us achieve great level of success that free, future year. And you go out and get a Donovan Mitchell, which is um, a monumental trade for a franchise. So we've made some major changes. We made some real uh, injections of talent into this roster. And so now is the time to figure out, okay, how do we win with this big? Because we have had a lot of success with this group. You don't win 99 games uh, and be back-to-back -back home court advantage playoff teams uh, without that. And now it's trying to figure out, you know, how to, how to go further. Good questions. I mean, it's all semantics in terms of what you want to list it for. Um, no, no, no strain on the relationship, though. Hey, real quick, you said that, uh, and this doesn't count, but, um, <laughs> but, 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 but you said that uh, Donovan and Jared were plus five net rate, and then you said that uh, Mobley and Allen were better. So do you know what that number was? I'm going to say it was plus... 5.7, I can get you that number. I think it was, it was higher, it was like plus 5.7 or something. Together, net rating together on the floor. Okay, that's gonna wrap it up. We'll have everybody next Thank you. Thank you, thanks. Thanks, guys. Thank you.